happy to be here. Um, can you hear me okay? Is that better? I think it's a wonderful idea to be having this series on compassion. Um, to my mind, it's one of the most important traits we can cultivate and important ways to really open our hearts to other people, but also, um, as we'll talk about tonight, also ourselves, which is something that we often overlook. Um, so I'll be talking about self-compassion, which is my research passion, my compassion passion. And uh, give you a little background of how I got interested in self-compassion. Um, when I was finishing up my PhD at Berkeley, I actually started um, practicing Buddhism at the time. And uh, Buddhism is fairly well known for emphasizing compassion. And what surprised me was the emphasis, the deep emphasis placed on self-compassion, the idea that if you really want to be able to open your heart to others and be moved by their suffering, you first have to um, give yourself that warmth, that tenderness, that caring, um, to give yourself the strength and the resilience and the, and the um, equanimity in order to be able to be moved by the suffering of others. And it, it really uh, it changed my life. There's a, there's a reason I'm a bit of a self-compassion zealot. It's because it's really transformed me. So much so, in fact, my husband and I were going at the same time, and we got married later that summer, and we actually wrote the, the vow and our marriage vows to help each other be self-compassionate because we thought it was so important um, and it's something that we try to actually incorporate into our relationship and it makes a big difference. Um, so I'll be talking about my research, but you know, just understand this is really something that comes from my heart, something that uh, I think really works um, and, well, it's important to me. So, okay, so that's one part of the history. And then another part is um, after getting my PhD, um, at Berkeley, I did what's called a, a postdoctoral um, uh, internship, really, uh, in Denver with a woman who studies self-esteem, very well-known self-esteem researcher. So I'll do my first slide. Um, now everyone's heard of self-esteem. There's been a zillion books on self-esteem. Uh, Oprah talks about self-esteem. Everyone talks about self-esteem. There's been uh, there has been a major movement in the schools to teach kids self-esteem. Um, what may be a little less well known is um, the last 10 years or so, psychology has started falling out of love with self-esteem uh, for a few reasons. Um, some of the problems with self-esteem is, first of all, um, self-esteem is an evaluation of self-worth, feeling good about ourselves. The problem with that is that it's contingent on success versus failure, right? So we feel good about ourselves and we succeed and reach our goals and we're motivated and we're doing well. But then when we aren't so motivated or we aren't doing so well or we fail or we notice something about ourselves we don't like or something really difficult happens, then our self-esteem tends to fall. So it tends to go up and down, up and down. Our, our sense of self-worth is um, very unstable for that reason. Um, the other problem with self-esteem, and this is especially in American culture, is that we have to feel unique, um, above average, to feel okay about ourselves. Uh, in fact, in psychological research right now, if you want, if you want to insult someone in, in, for an experimental paradigm to see how they react, you can't tell them you're lousy, you're below average. If you tell someone they're average, they take that as an insult. I mean, how many of you have someone said that you were average at something, would feel good about that? You'd probably feel insulted, right? It's like the Lake Wobegon effect. We all have to feel above average to feel okay. Uh, then if you start looking at that, there's a little bit of a problem, right? If everyone has to feel above average, there's no way we can all be above average. Um, so what happens, and this is related to um, the other potential downside of self-esteem, is one of the ways we feel good about ourselves, or we try to feel good about ourselves, is by putting other people down, right? If I have to be above average to be okay, then you have to be below average. Um, and in fact, when they study groups, uh, people who are very prejudiced, for instance, they tend to have high self-esteem because that's how they get their high self-esteem. They're part of this privileged in-group, people in the out-group, um, you know, the other people in the other ethnic groups especially or uh, whatever group is out. Um, they put them down in order to, to puff themselves up. Um, another problem is um, narcissism. Uh, some people are so invested in the need for high self-esteem that they just get this very inflated self-image. They can't see themselves clearly. They're just always thinking they're better than the other person. And it's really kind of a desperate attempt for them to feel okay about themselves. Um, and, and what they find 
as well as self-esteem is uh, very aggressive people. It's people with high self-esteem that tend to be really aggressive. If you all think about the times when you get really, really angry, when, you, when, you, when someone's really got your goat, it's probably some little insult involved there, some feeling that, well, if I admitted that or what you said made me feel bad about myself. And when we feel bad about ourselves, our, we often have this threat reaction. Our sense of self is threatened and we want to you know, blame the other person. It's much, I can feel much better about myself if I blame you rather than blame myself for what just happened, right? So actually the need for self-esteem, the need to feel good about ourselves actually can drive some pretty destructive relationship behavior as well. So um, I thought as I was learning all this about self-esteem, um, oh, by the way, I should just caveat to this. Um, it doesn't mean that low self-esteem is good either. Low self-esteem is problematic. If you have low self-esteem, if you don't like yourself, you tend not to be motivated, you're often depressed, you often have anxiety. Um, you know, in the worst case scenario, you might start thinking about suicide. Um, which among our teens today is all, an all too common attempt. So it's not that low self-esteem is good, but high self-esteem isn't all it's cracked up to be. And so when I started practicing self-compassion and I saw how transformative it was, I also thought that it'd be really nice alternative to self-esteem, another way to think about how to relate to ourselves. Um, right now when we think about having positive emotions towards ourselves, we typically think in terms of self-esteem, judging myself positively. This is another way to think about having positive emotions towards yourself that doesn't require judgment. Okay, and I'll, I'll come back to that point. Okay, so what is self-compassion? Um, it's really the process of extending feelings of compassion, caring, um, tenderness, uh, understanding to oneself for one's failings, inadequacies, and also just general experiences of suffering. Um, and so it's really a type of open-heartedness, and I like to use that word even though it's actually not very psychological or scientific, but I think everyone intuitively knows what it feels like, those moments in their lives when they feel like their heart is open. So there's a real receptivity, a real tenderness, um, a real openness to be moved by someone's suffering. Uh, and the idea is that you can, that, that feeling of compassion you can have towards yourself as well as well as others. Um, but I like to start off talking about compassion for others because especially in our culture, it's, it's a much more common feeling than self-compassion.